Hey everybody, it's Mr. Smeads, and welcome to Abe's Video Notes for Topic 6.5, which will be on fossil fuels. So our objective for the day is to be able to describe the uses and the methods of energy production from fossil fuels, but also to be able to describe the environmental impacts that fossil fuels have. The skill that we'll practice at the end of today's video is describing an environmental problem specifically related to fossil fuels. So the first thing we have to discuss today is what a fossil fuel combustion reaction actually looks like. So this is a reaction between oxygen and fossil fuels, which are just hydrocarbons. So they are molecules that are made up of carbon and hydrogen. When these two molecules interact, they're going to release a lot of energy as heat. And that's the really valuable aspect of fossil fuels. We should also know, though, that they produce carbon dioxide and water as byproducts. So again, we want to remember, this is really important, that fossil fuel combustion is a step in the carbon cycle. Now, if we remember this and we kind of just think of it as following the carbons, it can be really helpful in not necessarily memorizing this reaction, but understanding it. So remember that these are hydrocarbons or fossil fuels that are burned in the presence of oxygen to release energy. And then the carbon from those hydrocarbons is going to combine with the oxygen in the air. And that's how we get the carbon dioxide that's released. So if we look at this diagram here again, we can see this oxygen surrounding the hydrocarbon fuel source. And then when they get close enough and the oxygen reacts with the carbon, that releases a lot of energy. Remember, that's the valuable aspect of fossil fuels. And then that's going to produce carbon dioxide when the carbon and the oxygen interact. And it's also going to produce water from the hydrogen and the oxygen. Really important to also understand that this is the same process with any fossil fuel, whether it is gasoline or methane, which remember is CH4, or butane or propane or even coal. These are all hydrocarbon molecules that combust in the same way. Uh, even wood and biomass fuels are going to work similarly. There's carbon in, in you know, biomass and in wood. And so it doesn't really matter what the carbon source is. When carbon is burned in the presence of oxygen, we get energy and we produce carbon dioxide. So this diagram can just help us remember that even if it's methane, still going to release a lot of energy, still going to produce carbon dioxide as a byproduct. Next, we'll talk about the generation of electricity from fossil fuel sources. So the number one source globally of electricity production is coal, closely followed by natural gas. And so the next thing we're going to talk about is a big picture idea here. So we have to have this big concept down instead of memorizing the steps. So the concept here is that electricity generation always comes from, uh, in this case, I should say, is going to come from these consistent steps here. And that is the generation of heat by burning something. That heat is used to turn water into steam. That steam is then forced through a pipe, which will turn a turbine. A turbine you can think of as almost looking like a fan. It's a giant uh, kind of metal device that can be spun by the steam. That turbine is going to then power a generator. And that generator is going to produce electricity from the kinetic motion of the turbine. And so again, these steps are going to be similar regardless of what we are burning to create that initial heat. So we'll look at this in a diagram that will be a little more helpful uh, than just the emojis, which are a nice way to remember. But we want to understand this more conceptually too. So here we'll start out with coal because again, coal is the number one fuel source for generating electricity. So the coal gets crushed up, fed into a boiler where it is burned, and that heat will turn the water that's coming in through this pipe into steam. Now steam in a pipe is really, really highly pressurized. So when it's forced past this turbine, it's going to spin the big turbine, which has all these blades, almost like a jet engine. And the kinetic motion of this turbine can power a generator. A generator has some magnets inside of it that can be spun around each other, which creates basically uh, electricity. And we don't need to understand it deeper than that. Um, but I just want to point that out in case you're wondering, you know, wait, how does the turbine, you know, actually create electricity? And so those spinning magnets in the generator will produce an electrical current that goes out transmission lines to consumers who can then use it for you know, whatever purposes. And so one thing I want to remind us of is that this is the same regardless of what we burn. So it could be coal, it could be oil, it could be natural gas, biomass. We even burn trash sometimes to create electricity. So we have a reminder here that again, the input can change, but these steps are going to be consistent. Even when we cover nuclear electricity generation in 6.6, we'll see that most of the steps are the same. Next, we'll talk about some of the environmental consequences of using coal as an energy source. 
So the first thing is that we're going to have habitat destruction when we clear land in order to mine the coal. So this could be the removal of a forest ecosystem, again, to bring in digging equipment to get that coal out of the ground. Uh, the next thing is that there's the release of a lot of air pollutants and a lot of carbon dioxide. Now, remember, there's a difference here. Air pollutants are specific chemicals that lower air quality from a breathability or from a health standpoint, whereas carbon dioxide is going to act as a greenhouse gas to drive global warming. So let's take a look at some specific air pollutants. Um, before we do that, though, we should remember that coal is the most carbon dioxide releasing fossil fuel. So that's an important point to remember. In addition to carbon dioxide, though, it's going to release some specific pollutants. These specific pollutants could be things like NOx, SOx, and VOx, which we'll look at more in depth in our air pollution unit. But there are also things like particulate matter, like soot or ash. And these can be respiratory irritants for both humans and animals in the surrounding area. Another point is that there's a lot of toxic ash that's produced. This toxic ash has lead and mercury and arsenic. Uh, and normally it's taken to landfills to be disposed of, but it can also be disposed of in ash ponds, which are basically pools of water that contain the ash basically on site near where it is produced. The problem here is that these can leak into the surrounding soil, into surrounding ground and surface water, and that can be a huge problem for the organisms that live in those areas. Uh, they can be poisoned, they can get poisoning from the lead, they can be uh, given cancer through the arsenic, the mercury also acts as a neurotoxin. So there's a lot of harmful environmental consequences if that toxic ash escapes in the environment. And then finally, we have the release of SOx and NOx. These are sulfur and nitrogen oxides, which are released when coal is burned. Uh, they're respiratory irritants to human and animals, and they also drive acid rain. Now we'll talk a little more about the efficiency of different fossil fuel sources. So coal is only about 30% efficient. And what that means is that only about 30% of the chemical energy in the hydrocarbon bonds stored in coal actually get converted into electricity when it's burned. Natural gas, on the other hand, is about 60% efficient. Uh, so it's going to be almost twice as efficient as coal. An important point here is that most of the lost energy or the energy that's not converted into electricity is going to escape as heat from the burning of these fossil fuels. So remember, just like our trophic pyramid all the way back in unit one, when energy is converted from one form to another, we lose some of it as heat. So when we convert it from chemical energy in the bonds of the hydrocarbons in coal or natural gas into electricity, we're going to lose a lot of the energy as heat. Now, one way that we can limit this process is through cogeneration. Cogeneration is a solution to this heat loss where basically you take the heat that's generated while you're creating electricity from you know, a fossil fuel source and you use that heat to heat a building or to heat up the water for a building in replacement of a water boiler. And so if we take a look at this diagram, we call this a combined heat and power system, and it can be close to 80 or 90% efficient. So it's a way to make the heating of a building far more efficient. If we look here in a conventional system, we're putting fuel to the power plant to produce the electricity. We're also putting fuel into the boiler to heat air and heat water for the building. But in a combined heat and power system, we're putting in fuel and the heat that's produced, instead of just being lost to the environment, is used to heat both water and air in the building, and we get a far more efficient use of energy. So this slide should look familiar at this point. Uh, this is our third time going over this, but it's really critical. And I just want a quick recap of crude oil or petroleum extraction before we talk about environmental consequences. So remember that we can drill for liquid petroleum either under the ocean or on land, basically anywhere that there is semi-permeable sedimentary rock capped by a hard rock that contains that um, oil or uh, you know crude oil deposit beneath it. Then if we look at tar sands, remember those are going to be deposits of bitumen, which is basically really thick, you know, molasses-like consistency, oil deposits that have a lot of impurities like sand and clay. And we're going to have to use a lot of water, a lot of steam to pipe it into the ground to get that oil to flow out in a liquid form. And then that bitumen is extracted taken to a refinery, and then it can kind of be separated into the oil or the petroleum and the impurities, and then we can actually use it just like we'd use any other petroleum source. Now we'll talk about some of the environmental consequences of extracting petroleum from tar sands. So as with most forms of fossil fuel extraction, there's going to be some habitat destruction. Now this could be uh, due to actually clearing land for the roads, for the digging equipment, uh, or for the equipment itself. And so we can see a picture here where this habitat, uh, this boreal forest likely, has been 
removed in some area and fragmented. So parts of the forest have been cut off from other parts of the forest. And that's again, to clear the land, to actually dig, you know, to access the tar sands, but also to create all the roads that have to transport it. Then we also have the contamination of ground and surface waters uh, and the depletion of ground and surface waters. So there's so much water required uh, to generate all the steam that will be used to extract the petroleum from the bitumen. And so that's going to, again, deplete nearby ground and surface waters because they're extracting the water to use in this bitumen washing process. Then we could have water contamination. Now this is gonna occur because we store the used water in what are called tailing ponds. These are ponds that have water, a mixture of bitumen and the water that was used to extract the bitumen and they can overflow and run into nearby surface waters or they can leach into the groundwater. This is a problem because they have chemicals like benzene, salt, acid, and even hydrocarbons and leftover bitumen. Benzene, I wanna point out, is a carcinogen, so it can cause cancer. Um, and then we have this picture here to kind of help us remember what these mine tailing ponds look like, how big they can be, and how easily they can escape into the surrounding environment. And then finally, there's gonna be some carbon dioxide released by the machines as well as the actual mining process itself. Next, we'll cover some of the environmental consequences of petroleum extraction. Uh, so the first one is going to be the possibility of a spill. Now, this could be either from a tanker or a ship that's transporting petroleum from the ocean onto land or a pipeline that's carrying it across land. Uh, in the ocean, this petroleum can cover the surface of the water, block the sun, which would decrease photosynthesis in the ocean can clog the gills of fish, it can suffocate many organisms, and it can stick to the feathers of birds, as we can see in this picture here. If it spills on land, it's going to act as a toxic chemical to the roots uh, of plants. It can also be toxic to soil, you know, microbes that are decomposers or nitrogen fixing bacteria. Um, and notice though that I'm saying that it's toxic here, but I should specify that the hydrocarbons in the petroleum are toxic. Remember, we never want to use the word chemical in apes. I kind of caught myself doing it there without actually specifying a contaminant or a toxicant. Uh, and then a final consequence that's common to most fossil fuel extraction forms is habitat destruction or fragmentation. So this could be due to the roads, to access the drilling sites, to transport the crude oil, uh, or just to create the pipelines. So we can see here, this pipeline has to extend over a huge stretch of land. Uh, it's going to fragment or break apart forest ecosystems, which can cut off populations that live in those ecosystems from one another. So this is another big environmental consequence of petroleum extraction. Next, we'll talk about a natural gas extraction method called fracking or hydraulic fracturing. So it's basically a method from extracting natural gas from sedimentary rock that's difficult to reach for traditional extraction. What's going to happen is a vertical well is going to be drilled down into the sedimentary rock, and then it's going to turn horizontally and continue through the rock layer, as we can see in this diagram here. Then what happens is a perforating gun is sent out basically to crack little holes in the rock layer to increase the permeability, which will allow the natural gas to flow out more easily. Then fracking fluid, which is a mixture of water, salt, detergents, and acids, is pumped into the ground at really high pressures and this will fracture the rock even more, which just increases the flow of that natural gas out of the rock. The natural gas will then be collected in a pipe that will carry it up to the surface. And so I wanna zoom in on this diagram just a little bit to walk us through this. Again, a, a vertical wheel, uh, well is drilled down, then it turns horizontally. And all of these fissures are created by this little perforating gun that shoots basically spikes into the rock. Uh, and then that water is pumped in at a really high pressure. That's gonna crack or fracture the rock. And then the natural gas trap there, we can see in this zoom in kind of here, is going to flow out of the cracked sedimentary rock into the pipe back up to the surface where it can be collected. Now, a problem with this is this flow back water or this used fracking fluid, basically. It's going to be stored in wells nearby or in ponds, and that can leak out into the environment, which we'll talk about shortly. And another thing I want to do before we move on is quickly look more closely at that fluid. And so if we look at fracking fluid, it's going to have salt, uh, it's going to have detergents. This is basically going to be to lubricate the well so the natural gas flows out more easily. And what we're going to see here is that's a problem if it escapes and leaks out into the surrounding environment. And finally, we'll wrap up today by talking about the environmental consequences of fracking. So one thing is the possibility of the well leaking. And so this is going to release contaminated you know, fracking fluid out into the groundwater. 
Remember that that fracking fluid has salt, detergent, and acids, as well as the hydrocarbons in the natural gas, which could all be contaminants to the nearby ecosystem. Uh, another thing is that the ponds where this fracking fluid is stored temporarily can leak as well. So it could rain really hard, they could overflow, leak into the surrounding area. So if we look at this picture here, we could kind of imagine how that pond might overflow, contaminate nearby groundwater or surface water. And remember that could be toxic to both plants and animals there. Uh, animals and plants that rely on groundwater or you know local ponds or uh, rivers for drinking water. And again, those contaminants, specifically salt, detergent, and acid, those could all be toxic to those animals. Another problem is groundwater depletion. So this could just be the using up of the groundwater and the surface water as it's drawn from to be used in the fracking fluid. Fracking fluid is mostly water and it requires tons and tons and tons of it for a single well. And so that's a problem because that can make local water sources run out. And then finally, we have the possibility of increased seismic activity, uh, specifically earthquakes. And this is not from the actual fracking itself, uh, but recent studies have concluded that it's probably from the injection of wastewater into deep wells in the ground where the wastewater is stored. So companies, uh, when they're done with this fracking fluid, don't really have anywhere to put it because it's just so toxic beyond belief that it can't really be reintroduced into ecosystems easily. So what they do is they inject it in these wells deep, deep, deep below the ground, but they put it so deep that it can actually shift you know, local tectonic sort of formations and lead to earthquakes. So we have a graph here. This is from the US uh, Geological Survey. And they have found here that, you know, starting after about 2008, which remember is kind of the fracking boom in America, there's a slow increase and then a massive increase in uh, earthquakes of magnitude 3.0 or higher. And scientists, you know, cannot prove for sure that this is from fracking, but uh, several have hypothesized or theorized that the injection of this wastewater into these deep wells is likely contributing to this increased seismic activity. Uh, and this is specifically in Oklahoma. And then finally, some consequences that are common again to most fossil fuel extraction is going to be habitat fragmentation or habitat destruction. And then specifically to uh, fracking because it's the extraction of natural gas usually, there's going to be methane release. And that's important because methane is a very potent greenhouse gas you know, 84 to 86 times as warming as carbon dioxide. And so that's going to contribute quite a bit to climate change. In our practice FRQ for topic 6.5 today, what I want you to do is to try explaining one environmental consequence of tar sand petroleum extraction, and then a different environmental consequence of hydraulic fracturing or fracking.